Hey, well, good morning. Welcome back to Bulldog Coffee Break with Jay Gittinger here. Bulldog men's basketball, great. We're going to give it a minute or two. People are still getting connected, and Jay's on the road, so we were getting him fired up technologically here. So uh, we're going to give it just another moment. Thank you for your patience. All right, well, looks like folks have pretty much connected in. So, Jay, welcome to the Bulldog Coffee Break, sponsored by our, our friends at Duluth Coffee Company. We'll be sending you a, a nice little care package of, of Tumblr. I even get some coffee over my shoulder here on the shelf. So, appreciate our, our good friends there sponsoring us. Thank you so much for, for being a part of, of our Bulldog Coffee Break and spending some time with us talking about your journey, your life as a Bulldog. We're very excited to... Uh, to hear from you today and and you're such a big piece of that basketball legacy for the folks that don't know too much about jay a absolute bulldog great a hall of fame member uh multiple i think conference player of the year one of only two folks to from the bulldog program to make it to the professional ranks uh, an all-around just great human being and uh We'll talk about a, a record that he may have lost recently that stood for a long time, which is just a great story in itself. And um, I think I've heard from many folks, including from Jay himself, nobody was happier to see that record go down than, than Jay. But in any event, uh, a Milwaukee, Wisconsin native. And, and I just think sometimes the best way to start these, Jay, is tell us about your, your, your high school sports student athlete experience and then your, your recruiting journey to UMD. Sure, sure. Well, thanks. First time, Josh, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity and, and hello to everyone that's on the call. Uh, I, I echo your sentiments and hope everyone's doing well in these crazy times. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, born and raised in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, one of 10 children. Um, dad was a firefighter for the city of Milwaukee. Um, we um, uh, always seemed to have enough. We always made do. Um, I had five older brothers that were pushing me all the time, being the youngest of the six boys overall. And uh, high school was, uh, I guess I would say, uh oh, hold on here. I made a, Josh, am I still there? Yeah, we got you. We just lost your video briefly. Now you're back. All right, I'm back. All right. Uh, high school was uneventful for me. I mean, it was eventful in certain ways, but uh, I didn't uh, accomplish uh, or, or accumulate the accolades that a lot of athletes, would, you would see that um, uh, nowadays for sure, the all conferences or the all states or the all districts or any of that didn't have the fortune of um, uh, uh, earning any of those distinctions. Uh, and I guess in the, long, in the long run, that was probably a good thing um, because it, it's kind of how I got to UMD. Um, certainly, there's a, I have a brother that played ahead of me who um, a four-year player, Jeff Gittinger, is that most people would know that might be on the call that are fans of the program. Um, very good basketball player and All-American as well. And then Coach Race, Coach Holquist, and Butch Cronin, Coach Cronin, you know, they knew that Jeff had a younger brother. Now, Jeff and I were four years removed, exactly four years removed, so we never had an opportunity to play together. Mm. Uh, and so there was that distance in between, but – they knew I was a big kid, and, and they started talking to me relatively early, and I appreciated that. But as all, any younger brother would want, they want to one-up their bigger brother. Um, and in this case, would have been all of them in that case. So I had aspirations of wanting to play Division One basketball. Uh, and didn't at that time, in that era, just knew I just had to play as well as I could, you know, to see if that would happen. And uh, But never, uh, ever a doubt from Coach Holquist and Coach Race, Coach Corona, and they were constantly on me. They were calling. They were doing the right thing, staying in touch. But I was hesitant and I was reluctant to give them my commitment to come to UMD. Um, as fate would have it, uh, two weeks, I, I, I beg your pardon, as fate would have it, towards the middle of the season, Marquette University came to practice mm -hmm. and watched a, a practice. The head coach at the time, I believe, was Bob Duquette. And uh, after practice, introduced themselves. We talked, talked with my coach. 
Uh, and at that point had indicated, we definitely would love you to, to walk on at Marquette at this point. I was uh, elated. I was, it was a division one program it, right here in Milwaukee, close to home. Um, two weeks after that, I unfortunately, but maybe fortunately suffered my first uh, knee injury and I tore the mm. ACL in my left knee. Mm. It, was at, at, it was at that time I thought for sure any aspirations of playing any college basketball were over. That was back in 1987. Um, so I uh, had the surgery. You know, we went into a surgery where they were going to scope it and just find out we didn't have the MRI at that time. So the doctors mm -hmm. went in, scoped it. They came out to the waiting room. My dad was uh, at the fire department. My mom was in the waiting room. They asked her what 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 type of procedure should we do? Should we should we give them a new ACL or we have a, a, an alternate procedure? You know, what are his aspirations? And um, she just certainly was just do what was right, and he would love to play basketball in the fall. Um, and so the decision that was made while I was under anesthesia was just to, to use an older technique that was um, uh, a good technique, but it wasn't where they replaced the ACL. Um, so after that surgery was completed, though, Coach Race and his staff, Coach Hopeless, and he can attest to it, they, they never let up. They, they knew. Uh, I think they appreciated what Jeff had brought to the program and, and what our family was all about. They stuck with me. They knew there was a path uh, to bring me into the program to make sure I'd stay on a path that if basketball didn't work out, certainly they would, they would help chart a path for me to get an education, you know, at the same time. Um, and, and I couldn't, I, you know, at the time you don't think about it, Josh, and you know, how grateful you need to be for someone to actually take a, a concern or a liking to you. And, and I talk about how uh, realizing potential and for some reason or another, these guys just, they felt like we need to get them in here and we just need to see what was going to happen, you know, see what, see if he could get healthy and see what would happen. So, and, and so reluctantly, even still after the surgery, you know, not being a young, you know, 18 year old kid, still not knowing what to do next after such a major traumatic experience, I wasn't sure how it was going to unfold. Um, yeah. But I did commit to, to coach race and the program said, I'd love to come. They knew full well what they were getting. I, uh, in years, as years have gone by, I, my brother, I had another brother, Jerome Gittinger, that was in school there as well. Um, and Jerome and Jeff uh, told me and have told me many times that when they heard, of, when Coach Race, Coach Hoquist, and Coach Cronin heard about my injury, they actually were enthusiastic. They were excited. They were like, thank goodness. Now we got them is what I heard. Now we got them. And, uh, and that's really, truly what happened. It's truly what happened. The injury really did just push me on a path to UMD. And without a doubt, I'll say, I'll say it probably many times as we talk, it was the best thing that ever happened. Uh, that's a great story. It's funny how far uh, and, and our expectations around the sports medicine now where there's an instant MRI and you're, you're in surgery the next day, we forget it really wasn't that long ago that um, there was a lot of unknown and, and whatnot. And, and I've heard uh, a lot of those stories about how injuries change the path um, of an athlete, particularly on their way to the college ranks, but uh, almost all of them, while it delivers some adversity, there's positivity to that and it makes you stronger. And it's that analogy of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I, I certainly buy into that. So, and certainly no surprise that uh, our coaching staff, knowing the high character uh, that you are and, and, and your family is would stick by you. And, and I'm also not surprised to hear that they knew that maybe that would get the D ones to back off and, uh, that, that lock you up a little bit. So that's that's a good story. I didn't know all the details on that one. That, that's a great story. I'll pause here just to let our folks know if you have a question, please use the chat feature. Periodically, I'll, I'll, I'll sort through those and pull them in and, and throw them at Jay. And again, Jay, thanks so much for doing this. I want to echo Jay's sentiments. We wish everybody well out there in this, this tough time. And hopefully we can give you a few minutes to hear some stories like we just did and be a little bit of a distraction from uh, the challenges of the present day. So uh, with that, talk a little bit about your time at UMD. I mean, it was an incredible run, as, as we know. I purposely didn't dive into the details because we want to hear about it, not from the numbers and the statistics. We want to hear about your experience and what it was like to be be a Bulldog at a time that basketball was doing well, and, and it's doing well again. Absolutely. I mean, couldn't be more proud of the direction of the program now. 
and what Justin's doing with the program, the players he's got to buying into what that philosophy is about being successful in the classroom and on the court, quite honestly, and in the community, you know? Um, so that's really exciting, but yeah, we, I came in at a great time. Uh, and again, as I, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, didn't win a lot of games, uh, in high school, we weren't as relevant as some of the top teams in the state of Wisconsin personally didn't acquire anything. So coming to UMD where there was a great tradition that had been established, uh, there was great community support already. Um, we won games right out of the gate. And, you know, for me personally to walk in after having a traumatic knee injury eight months later, uh, roughly, um, and then to put on the uniform and start that first game, I would have never dreamt that. I would have never expected that of myself. And I know it's the broken record, but it speaks volumes to what Coach Holquist, Coach Race, and Butch Corona did uh, or saw in me that I didn't see in myself. And you look back, I reflect on that. And I'm just, a lot of times I'm in so much awe over the character of the, the staff that, that you guys have to assemble that you continue to work with um, in all your sports. And how important, how much you guys have to work hard at making sure they're really, uh, they're, they're not, not only are they high character, but they're finding kids that are high character that, we don't know what we can be until someone kind of pushes you a little bit in the right way. Uh, so, yeah, as, you know, I part of that story when recruiting, you know, I graduated high school. I, I, I'm probably like a Friday. And a week later, I moved up to Duluth uh, and moved in with my brother, Jeff, and my other brother, Jerome, were there. And I started my rehab program. Had I not done that, I probably wouldn't have mm -hmm. been on track. Uh, again, the, the, the medical sciences and the physical therapy and all that type of uh, specialty and expertise was there. And it worked tremendously to give me that opportunity to come into camp and, and then compete for a spot. You know, it was never given to me, but uh, they put me in positions to succeed. And I certainly did. And I'm very grateful for that. So we started out and I know I, tell, I, I think of a story, Dave Hauser, who a lot of people on the call would remember, a uh, great friend of mine to this day, best friend of mine to this day. We were walking out of the gym probably three quarters of the way through the season or close to the end. We might have, in fact, we might have just won maybe a district, the district championship, and we're walking out to our car uh, with his dad, and we looked at each other laughing because we, we just joked how we hadn't won this many games in four years combined in our high school careers, as we had just won 24, 25 games that season at UMD. And I just can't, I can't tell you how, how much fun it was to be associated with the program, the community, the other teams. I mean, the, the support in the community was just, I, I hadn't seen anything like it, you know, and, and people that were general, genuinely interested in, that not only the success of UMD, but that we were being good kids and we were doing the right things and, and wanting us to, to win and, and, and experience that. It's the greatest experience in the world to win at any sport, you know, at any level to win. It's just, it's an amazing feeling. Yeah, you touched on something. I want to pause briefly, the, the community support piece. The, the community support is incredible uh, that the Bulldogs have across the board in all the sports and uh, it's it's been so much fun over the last couple of years with the success of of the the men's program and the women's basketball program, and, and some of the facility improvements to see the crowd just getting bigger and bigger and the energy in Romano now um, is probably and I'd have to defer to the experts because I obviously wasn't here but like it was when it was rolling before and. Um, I personally enjoyed seeing how excited that Gary and Karen are to to see the basketball programs back where I think we all believe they belong and to see some of the older time fans that remember um, what it was like when when you and others were playing uh, just all jacked up again and and in their seats standing up and, and yelling and it's uh, it's pretty cool so I'm um, I'm glad that you're proud of the program right now as an athletic director that's something that's important to me to make sure that our alums are proud and and uh, that's 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 exciting stuff. Um, great, great to hear. So, yeah, tell us tell us about your professional basketball experience and playing for the Cavs. You know, I mean, LeBron James wouldn't be what he is today if you had laid some groundwork in Cleveland for him. Well, that might be a stretch, Josh. <laughs> Just a little bit of a stretch. But uh, uh, again, another another experience, another th thing that happened to me that I would have never 
dreamt I'd have an opportunity um, to do. Uh, you know, the four years at UMD, each year built on itself. And, and I have to do a shout out to every, absolute every teammate that, that came into the program that I had the, the fortune of playing with. Um, you know, I wouldn't have won or been selected for player of the year this or, you know, all conference or all district or all American if it really wasn't for the entire, what the, the entire program was all about, mainly my teammates. Um, it just, it's, it speaks volumes to how good we really were in that time frame. And I think, you know, as, as naive as I was at the time and uh, just un, unsure of what I was, what potential I had, you know, I, I was, I was oblivious to the fact that there would be an opportunity to play after UMD. I was just fortunate after that knee injury in high school, my senior year, that I would have an opportunity to play four years and, and have, and, and can get some help financially to be able to do that. I mean, it was a dream come true at that point. And then when coach race, you know, he, he ran a coaching camp. I don't know if it was towards the, I think it was the summer between my junior and senior year. And I could be wrong. And he introduced the team uh, one player at a time because we, we were there to demonstrate uh, for the for the coaching clinic that he was putting on and as he introduced each player and that was the first opportunity you know that I had ever really paid maybe it, maybe it was the first time I paid attention to coach race I don't know or, or listened to him but uh, he introduced me or asked me to step forward and, and said that if I keep working hard I would have a chance to play in the NBA I didn't know at the time I'm like what did he say I was like you've got he's got to be crazy yeah, I knew the man was a little crazy, but I mean, is he just trying to build up this crowd or, you know, sure. And it's it certainly stuck with me, but as I would never go and question him afterwards, I, I passed it off as just yeah. something he was saying to kind of, you know, build up the crowd and, and whatnot. And even the, my teammates at the time, they're like, what, what did he say? You know, and we all were kind of like, there's no way, you know, out of UMD, someone's going to go to the NBA. There's no way someone's going to go to the NBA. So, uh, you know, we competed hard those four years. We made great memories going to the NAI National Tournament, Kansas City. Um, unfortunately, never getting it done at that national level, wishing that uh, we certainly could have put uh, a banner up in the, in the arena in Romano for everyone. Um, but great experiences. And, and then after that senior year, or during that, the latter part of that senior year, I think when Coach Race knew I was uh, – a little more mature, but not probably where I needed to be. He did sit me down and, and explain to me that, hey, there has been some interest. There have been some scouts at some of the games that they had contacted him. And, and there's interest to see, you know, is he, are you good enough? You know, there wasn't a path that says you're going to go, but there certainly was the interest going, hmm, is he good enough? If we, he's clearly been around a great supporting cast with teammates and players. He knows how to play the game. If we put him with uh, even better players and that are that have even more, will he work just as well with that group, and will he continue to evolve? Um, and I think that was was the direction, and that they were trying to steer to find out. Everybody wanted to find out if we put him in that direction, how will he continue to evolve? Because I tell that to my kids, I share that a lot. You don't want to be a finished product. I think right. even at fifty. Even at 50 years old, I, I don't consider myself a finished product. The kids laugh. Are you nervous? Do you get, yeah, you get, you want to do a good job, don't you? You know, in life, we always want to do a good job. So you, you always, I guess, have a little bit of nerves, even on a call like this. You want to say the right things. You want to do right. You want to do well. Mm -hmm. I said, don't ever lose that. Don't ever lose that in life. It should drive you. Good advice. So we, um, you know, we sat down and coach was like, is that something you want to do? As if I was going to say no. You know, I was like, well, absolutely. I'd love to try that. That'd be great. Um, so I set out and I went to Portsmouth, Virginia. That's where the NBA has one of, I believe, uh, two pre-draft, three pre-draft camps. So it's the first camp where the bubble players, the small college kids come together. We still have it today. And uh, we were able to, I think, invite two people because it was conducted in a high school gym. And uh, I know Coach Race came out. I forget exactly who was with him at the time, but I went into that camp uh, with nothing to lose at that point, and I think that served me well. Uh, knew I wasn't going to start the game at 
the first game I got into, but I knew I was just going to work hard. And unfortunately, as most people on the call might know or might not know, six minutes into that first game, uh, after I think I know I drop stepped and dunked on someone, I knocked down a jump shot, which I didn't take very many of, and Gary Hoke was can attest to that. Um, uh, had a steal. Uh, I can't remember exactly. I blocked someone's shot. Someone I forget who the player was, but statistically, in six minutes, I kind of checked all the boxes that I thought I needed to check. Yeah. And unfortunately, I checked one more. I got hurt and I tore my yeah. right ACL at yeah. that camp. Uh, devastating to say the least. Uh, but again, uh, at that age, no, no, I knew. Okay, well, let's just get it fixed and let's see what happens. But devastated that I wasn't able to kind of move along in that process to really, you know, earn my way there that, 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 that fall of 1991, that it would have been. Um, uh, so I went in, I know coach race tells the story uh, that he told me later on, he was sitting in the stands uh, in, in, in between or, or right behind got the likes of red R back and Jerry West and Wayne Embry, sure, yeah. some of these great general managers and, that were still around at the time. And that most people, uh, depending on the age of the people on the call, uh, we didn't have tablets uh, at that time. Right. Uh, so there was a clipboard or a folder with a sheet of paper. And coach said, you know, told me when I got in the game, there were stars next to my name. It was certainly interested to see what I was going to do. And as I did certain things, there were circles and there were underlines, there were check marks given. And then when I hit the floor, and they had to help me off. He said every one of them took that pencil and just crossed the name off. Crossed he said, right out. I just, they crossed me out. It was over at that point for them. You know, it's a weird because that probably somewhere motivated me to say, you know, sure, I'm coming back. You can you can cross me off now, but I'm going to give it another shot and we'll see where it goes. And uh, and that's kind of what happened. Moved, came back to UMD, came back to Duluth. Uh, Dr. Mark Carlson performed the surgery on my right knee. Uh, I'm not sure if he's retired at this point, if he's still in practice, did an excellent job, obviously, uh, by giving me a, a completely new ligament from my patellar tendon. Uh, stayed in Duluth, finished, graduated, trained that summer, or that year of 91, 92, and then that summer of 92, I had my first opportunity to go to a, a training camp. And uh, and I don't know, I'm getting kind of long-winded here, Josh. You tell me, I'll keep going. Oh, yeah, this, is, this is good stuff. Keep going. So uh, another great friend of, in Duluth, and there are many. I don't want to miss anyone, but uh, Dave Colquist, uh, Skyline uh, Bowling Alley and, mm -hmm. and Lounge, and Dave's Pete's up there. Uh, you know, during that year, uh, he had taken me under his wing and, and brought me out there and gave me the opportunity to work with him. So uh, I, it was June of 92. Uh, and Dave had a project. We were painting the outside of the building long before it was renovated to look like how beautiful mm -hmm. it looks now. But we were giving it a fresh coat of paint, and I was standing on a ladder. And he came out the back door because, again, we didn't have cell phones yet. And he said, Jay, you have a phone call at the front desk. So I put my paint bucket down under the ladder and covered it, walked in. Here it was uh, my agent that I had, uh, was working with. And he said, the Detroit Pistons are interested in bringing you into their training camp. It already started. So you're a, you're, a, you're a replacement player for someone else that got hurt. Are you interested in going? I said, absolutely, I'll go. Why not? You know, you have to go. He says, well, I need, I need you in Minneapolis at 3 o'clock. It's noon. There's a flight to Detroit. Yeah. They have a game tonight. I said, I said, not a problem. I hooked the phone. I looked at uh, Dave. I said, Dave, I'm sorry. I got to go. He, 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 I gotta he go. shrugged his shoulder. He's like, I got to go. He's like, hey, what about the paint? I said, ah. Yeah. Uh, somebody will clean it up. Thanks. I got to go. It, it, we laugh about it to this day. Um, but he, we packed up. I got down. There. I went to, I went to Detroit with the Pistons there in that uh, uh, June of 92 and their mini camp again, just throwing caution to the wind, you know, knowing that I had I, been working out, but I wasn't playing at an elite level yet with these guys. It wasn't physically as elite. I had just run grandma's half marathon with Gary Holquist, Butch Coronan, uh, uh, a couple of the other guys I forget from the equipment room now. Um, uh, it was an awesome experience to do that. And uh, here I'm on a plane going to Detroit for this camp. Now I went into that camp, thought about a lot of things on that airplane ride out there, thought about what to take with me. Sure. And, uh, you know, after a second ACL injury on another knee, you decide you, you get a little skittish. 
Um, yeah. and, and, and doubt did creep back into my mind. When I came to UMD, I wore a brace on my left knee my freshman year, the entire season. And then after that, uh, against the doctor's wishes, uh, you know, or the prescribed treatment, I didn't wear the, the brace. At, and, and not having the ligament, I was probably putting myself at, in more jeopardy sure. with the left knee by not having. But, you know, we had strength, strength training. I felt good. And I had no issues. Um, when I tore the right ACL again, I didn't play a competitive game after that until I went back to Detroit for that training camp. And as I packed things up, I remember looking over and I grabbed both of the braces for both knees. And these mm -hmm. are the fiberglass braces. That, and I took them with me, not sure uh, whether I was going to wear them both or not. And when we landed, we got to the, the palace in Auburn Hills and we suited up. I pulled them out. I put them both on and decided to wear them through the rest of that training camp. Um, it probably left a bad impression because I looked like a RoboCop out there. Um, sure. It just looked very mechanical. I thought I played well, you know, and, and I feel like I did um, for, for what, it, but I didn't look probably my best having those braces on. Maybe didn't look as confident uh, and as carefree as I should be in damaged goods maybe would be a good, yeah. great way to put it. However, I did play. Uh, there were tons of scouts. There were international scouts at the uh, training camp at the, the games that were hosted in Minneapolis um, at the Target Center or whatever it's called now. I don't exactly know, but um, Detroit declined after the camp. They, they said, thanks for coming. We appreciate the efforts, but we're not going to bring you back to veteran camp. Uh, so about August of that, uh, let me decline. I'm getting a call here. You guys still there, Josh? Yeah, we got okay. you. We're good. All right. August of that summer of uh, 92 then, uh, my agent, who had been working diligent for, diligently for me, uh, called and said, hey, I have an international opportunity in Belgium. Um, he, he recommended highly that I take it. I would have to leave in two weeks. And I had to take a pause for a minute with him. And I said, Don, I said, man, I have to know if I'm good enough. I got to know. I got to get cut. I got to go into a camp. I got to know I'm not good enough. And then I'll go do that. And, and to his, uh, um, to, much to his, um, he was rejecting that idea. He, he's like, okay, I get it, but you're passing up money. You know, you're passing up an opportunity to make money right away um, for really nothing that's guaranteed. And probably, he was pretty candid, probably pretty unlikely that I would make it. So, but I left it and I said, get me in there. I was playing with the house money. You know, I was like, Hey, I got ACL tear on both knees. I need to go in there and see if I can get it done. About a month later, he called and he had me an opportunity with the Cleveland Cavaliers. You know, Wayne Embry was the general manager at that time. Lenny Wilkins was the head coach, had a great staff. They had many, many great years, great team of guys, Larry Nance, Brad Doherty, Mark Price, Craig Elo. Um, Steve Kerr was actually on the team at the time. Um, Terrell Brandon, I go on and on. Um, they'd won a lot of games, but they'd never gotten over the hump. They were stuck in between Detroit's bad boy years and mm -hmm. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan really sure. coming of age with his, uh, yeah. with his career. Um, so I took the position that, hey, yeah, I'd love to go into that, that training camp. And I knew in my mind I wasn't going in there to try and prove to be the best player because I knew I wasn't going to be. But I had to be a really good basketball player if I wanted to make that team. And knowing that I probably wasn't, and they didn't have roster spots available, there were only 12 held at that time. Um, I just wanted to be the last guy that they cut. And I set that goal out for myself. And one thing led to another, Josh. And a month later, uh, Lenny Wilkins asked me to come into his office, which I thought was going to be a thanks, kid. We really appreciate yeah. your effort. Good luck. And it was, hey, thanks, kid. We really like you. We'd love to keep you around. And, and that started what became two years of just an unbelievable ride um, for someone from Milwaukee that would have never dreamt in a hundred years that I would take the court with the likes of a Magic Johnson or a Michael Jordan. Um, then the only guy I never got on there with was Larry Bird. You know, he yeah. retired in 91. But up and down the list, the Hakeem Olajuwon, um, James Worthy. I, I mean, I sit sometimes in awe of some of these names, the Barkley, Lambeers, Rodmans. I mean, oh, Pippen. It's just, it's, it's hard to believe. 
and it's almost you start I start to laugh about it because it's almost comical <laughs> you know, that sure, I got yeah. from Milwaukee to Duluth to the NBA it was just a great ride it was unbelievable and unfortunately uh, no, an injury it's, it's, all again. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a phenomenal story I think it, it speaks to the reason why sports is such an important piece of our society all of the obstacles you faced, all the perseverance, all the things that you overcame to have that incredible experience um, and, and represent Milwaukee, represent your high school, represent UMD uh, is, is such a cool thing and, and it just a, a, a great story. And I've heard a few of those over, over my career and every single one of them uh, kind of gets me fired up because uh, we face those challenges in life. The world is facing obstacles right now and, and sports, I think, empowers us to get through it. So thank you so much for sharing that piece with us. I really, I really appreciate that. I'm going to fire a couple of questions at you that, that we ask our seniors when, uh, in their exit interviews. So myself or someone else on the staff, we've got five of us that, that meet with the seniors as they finish their careers. And I'm going to give you a couple, just for fun, I'm going to give you a couple of the, uh, the uh, Bulldog student athlete exit interview questions. So the first one is, what was the best part of being a Bulldog? Oh, man, the best part of being a Bulldog, game day. Game day for not only our own sports, but all the other sports, too, for football, hockey, you know, wrestling, volleyball. I mean, it was just women's basketball. Don't let me forget that. I mean, it was – game day was always special around yeah. the program and around the department and, and really in the school community. The, the faculty, I'm telling you, they, they were yeah. huge supporters. Um, just loved the brand, you know, and thought that, I, and especially when the coaching staffs ran it right and knew that they were pushing us to try and make sure we're getting it done everywhere, you know, especially in the classroom. It was great to see um, faculty come to the games and then with their families too. I mean, that was, that was always special. In addition to the community, I can't, I know I sound like a, a, a commercial ad, but it was truly just Game day. Game day is always the most special experience, you know, that I can remember. I love it. I love it. To, to the folks on the call, I did not prepare Jay. I did not, <laughs> I did not give him any talking points. I want to be really clear there. Uh, to the faculty members on the call, I'm not compensating Jay for his comments at all today. So uh, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Jay. Uh, what was the worst part about being a Bulldog? Uh, you know, you tend to appreciate everything, but when you look back, um, it, the winters were tough. They were, those were long, but you, you learn to enjoy what made them hard to, to cope with, you know. And um, so, you know, maybe the weather, you know, the toughest part of, other than that, I mean, there was, everything about being a Bulldog was amazing. You know, it really was. The, it was a year-round, it was a life-changing experience, you know. But being, I don't know that anything was, looking back on it when you're 50, looking backwards going, hey, you had it made, kid. You didn't know how good it was. <laughs> you know? I think it's we great. all have some of that. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, so this is my favorite exit interview question. What advice would you give Jay Gettinger in the car coming up 53 uh, mm -hmm. rolling in a Duluth for the first time. What would you What would you rewind and give and tell your your eighteen nineteen year old self? I'll tell you what I've I've had to tell my eighteen nineteen year old kids, you know, and and I've had thought of that. Um, talk to your faculty supporters more. Talk to your advisors more. Uh, try to you know I, I try to be a better student about going in and actually talking about why you're struggling to be a good student. You know, because you're going through a lot of changes at that age and your focus is in a lot of different directions. So I thought about that. You know, it's like, hey, those those guys and those men and women were in your corner. Um, I just didn't initiate the conversation. And I think the beautiful thing of today with technology, it's so much easier to start or have a conversation with how busy they are with all the students and with technology on your side today. And that's not an excuse because you still have to have the maturity to, to reach out and say, hey, I, I need some help here or I need some help, or I'm not sure of what I should do here or there. Uh, I look back on that, the things would have been different for me as a student. I mean, I got by, but I didn't excel the way I know I could have. And I didn't appreciate what the opportunity 
what I didn't appreciate as much what that academic opportunity was. And then uh, I went on to get a master's degree and it kind of the, the switch uh, light switch went on and I thoroughly enjoyed my master's program and the interaction I had with faculty at Cleveland State University. It was interesting. That was great. And I, and I think it was then when I realized, man, I kind of let things slip a little bit go by me there from an academic standpoint. But uh, again, it's truth be told that the, the faculty supported, I mean, they were there pushing and they were, I knew they were there. It wasn't on them. It was certainly on the athlete. And I would tell any athlete or I would tell myself doing it again, sign up to go talk to your counselor, you know, and, and get in there and talk about it. They have kids, they, your age, probably they've gone through it themselves. They, there's a lot of advice. There's a lot of things you could have learned and done differently that way. But uh, in the end, I was able to get to the finish line, just not necessarily probably as proud of it as I'd like to be. Well, we're proud to call you an alum. And uh, uh, just seeing in the chat here also, appreciation for your academic comments. And I'd be remiss if, if I didn't uh, let you know that we're coming off one of our best, well, actually our best semester and best student athlete GPA ever. I'm sure you saw it, but uh, a semester GPA for our student athletes, a 3.44 and a year long GPA of a 3.36. Our student athletes really seized the opportunity with with COVID to to get some work done in the classroom and to hear you mention our mantra, our mission that you live of the three C's of excellence in the classroom community competition and Coach Holquist has has been a big piece of that for a long time is is great. Uh, a couple questions from the chat here: Who was the best player you played against in the NBA? Well. Uh, that I had to guard, uh, and again, this isn't the best player in the NBA, but that I had to guard was Hakeem Olajuwon. Uh, yeah. Houston won the, the championship in that right. era there. And he absolutely, Hakeem came into his own. I mean, it was such a struggle. His footwork was just off the charts. He played well with his back to the basket. Probably one of the last true big men that I believe uh, enjoyed receiving the ball in the low post with his back to right. the basket and, and wanted to go to work from there. Uh, like the Kevin McHales. I mean, the list is long, but the guys that I had to guard and had that offer was fortunate to actually guard him. Without a doubt, he was the best post player that I guarded. Now, I was I was blessed to be on the court with Michael Jordan, and uh, and sure. I and then I had great seats for many other games that I didn't get to play in for to see him play. And, and hands down, he's just a special basketball player. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard other folks who played against Jordan um, tell me that they had to almost stopped themselves from watching, that they had to, to focus on staying engaged when they were on the floor, not on the bench, on the floor, stopped themselves from watching him because it was just something to see up close that was almost distracting. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, it's just, and it's been so much fun to watch that Last Dance episode, you know, sure. uh, that whole story. It's just amazing that that era of, of basketball and what it, how it changed the game for what it is now for those professional players. Yeah. So you 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 married a bulldog women's basketball player. Um, and and there's there's we've got a lot of um, couples that played multiple sports and, and that's such a cool piece of of the bulldog bond. And you're also the parent of a student athlete. Talk a little bit about being the parent of a student athlete. Well I tell you it's uh, the best thing that ever happened to me in the Talk about realizing your potential. I certainly did in the, in the, in, on the basketball court and in real life by finding Kai, who played for the women's program there at UMD. Um, we've been together now, married with 26 years. It'll be this July and, you know, 30 overall. It's been just awesome. We have three wonderful children. My oldest daughter uh, is a student athlete. Um, some of you may know. I don't know. She just recently, she transferred to Western Illinois. She's transferred. She's at Minnesota State now in Mankato. Um, she's going to start this fall there, finish her two years out. She's pre-med. Uh, she's very excited about, um, you know, closing out her career there as a basketball player. Uh, it's nerve-wracking. It was tough. We moved away, as a lot of people know. We, don't get, we didn't get to many games her first two years. Um, we'll certainly – we're going to get to a few more now because then my, my middle son, who will be a freshman, he's going to be a Johnny. He's going to St. John's. Um, so we're excited about that opportunity that an hour in either direction from Minneapolis, we're going to be able to take in a game for them. And certainly technology has been great. I mean, we're so proud of these kids, uh, our kids for sure. Um, they, they, 
they look like and they act like they're listening to us, Josh. I don't know how much they really are, but uh, uh, we're certainly putting it out there. If any of it sticks, it'll help them. It'll help a lot you know, moving forward, give them a little more perspective. But they're certainly charting their own course, and uh, we couldn't be more proud and, and more excited to live through them. We really understand what it means to live through the children, um, to, to really experience that again, knowing it's got to be their own experience. They're sure. going to write their own chapters. You, you have to stay out of the way as much as you can. But, man, it just warms your heart to see them competing and, and having opportunities to experience that success and, and knowing they're doing it in the classroom, really setting themselves up for the rest of their lives, you know. And don't know if they'll be blessed as I was to be able to find the love of their life, you know, while they're at college. But uh, they're certainly both in great situations and great environments. And, and then I can't leave my youngest, who's going to start as a freshman this year. Uh, and, and, and we've got the fortune then of having him for hopefully eight more years of competition that we'll be able to enjoy with him as well. So we're in a good spot. We're very blessed. Can't be more thankful. Well, Sounds like you and Kai have done a heck of a job. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so I, I'd be remiss if I, if I didn't touch on one of the, the more fun experiences that I've been around, and that's, uh, of course, watching Brandon Meyer break your record and how you embrace that. And, and the video that you sent us was just fabulous. The crowd loved it on the video board in Romano. And Mr. Meyer signed, I think, just this week to play professionally over in Europe. So he's – furthering his career and, and reaching some goals and just a, a great representative. I, I, I can't think of, of better representatives to, of, of UMD than, than you and Brandon of, of the basketball, men's basketball program. So talk a little bit about uh, what it was like to have somebody break the all-time scoring record. And, and I, I personally, I love the way you embraced it. And, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was cool. It was really cool. You know, I, I would have never thought, coming in as a freshman that I would have a chance to be UMD's all-time leading scorer. Uh, didn't, uh, just dialing it all the way back to high school was never the focus of the offense there. Um, never put up the, the numbers. Um, but coming into UMD and having that opportunity to play in all those games. And then the style of play that Coach Race, Coach Holquist, and Coach Coronan, you know, we were a, we worked the clock. I mean, we moved the ball. And fortunately, I was a focus, and Coach Ray Scott, and they, those guys worked on getting the ball into the block. Um, and as that number grew, again, I didn't pay much attention to it. And thankfully, I prob was probably good that nobody focused on it back then, and social media wasn't there. I can't imagine what Brandon was going through as, you know, everybody saw him getting closer and closer and having to deal with that component. Um, so hats off to him for how he handled that. Um, and Mike Patterson, I mean, I, I got a shout out to him who held it prior to that. You know, he was able to be there uh, and present the ball after I had mm -hmm. broken it. That was very special. And I wish I could have been done the same for Brandon. But uh, I was so proud that in a superior native, someone close to the program uh, geographically, that will have family there, that will help continue that legacy and, and be there for you guys physically you know, as opposed to just in pictures and whatnot. Uh, I was so happy. I was, I, I got to admit, 29 years is a long time to hold the record. I, I, That's a I good run. It was a heck of a run, you know, and I missed a lot of free throws. I mean, kids remind me all the time, like, Dad, you wouldn't have lost that record had you made more free throws. And I certainly had my opportunities. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it was worth it. And he's a great kid. And I wish him a lot of success. In, in furthering his professional career. It's so awesome that he has an opportunity. I thought I've reflected back on that because there's been so many players in that time frame, And I know there are several that have had opportunities to play professionally, you know, all over the years. So I hope it's a great experience for him and I'm rooting for him. And you just never know where that's going to go um, for him personally. He's a real special kid, real special kid. So. Oh, no question. And, and we appreciate you and Mike being part of that legacy and passing that torch on and, and exciting. And uh, hopefully at some point, Brandon gets to enjoy the record for a little while, but, but later on someone else can break it and, and move our program even further forward. So uh, before we wrap up, I got one more chat question here. You know, we're always looking for dirt on Coach Holquist. So someone submitted a question. Oh, what boy. is your best Coach Holquist story that would be appropriate for this conversation. <laughs> oh man, 
that one, oh, well, I'll tell you what, you know, Coach Holquist had to take over for uh, Coach Race came down with some type of flu bug. I don't know if it was pneumonia uh, exactly, but he missed a few games. And Coach Holquist, uh, he had to step in and get his first taste of being the main guy there, UMD. I think it might have been during our – I think it was during our senior year, but I can't recall. But, uh, you know, he – he was a little nervous, you know, you could see he was, but we had his back. I think I remember walking up to him and telling him, Hey, don't worry. We got this coach, you know, just don't get thrown out or anything like that. <laughs> but, uh, uh, he did, he did a fantastic job, you know, as, as, as all the guys that played for him while he was a head coach too can attest, he's always in your corner. You know, he was there. He made sure that we had our, our post game meal uh, ready to go and, in spite of what Coach Race uh, might have tried to persuade him to not to do in terms of feeding us if he wasn't happy with the way we played. You know, he, he had our back, and um, can't, I, I appreciate him so much. Love him to this day. So just a great guy, and I'm sure his players that played for him would attest to the same thing. And he's a pretty yeah, good well, runner. Well, I got to tell you, I got to, one more thing. It's appropriate, not on the court, Please but him and, I, him and I ran that half marathon together which would have been back in oh gosh that was the summer or the springtime whenever they held it of 90 uh 92 uh the two of us uh ran that uh shoulder to shoulder the whole way and it was quite a struggle to get through it but he was there right by your side just as you would expect him. him to be he wouldn't mm -hmm. he didn't take a step back he hung in with kept me going when i wanted to quit and then when he knew i had enough in my tank to go he said go he pushed me he said go the last mile and a half and I I kind of pulled out not very far ahead of him but he's like go go get it that's the kind of guy he is awesome dude yeah I love it I love it he's uh forever a coach and and such a great asset to our department and uh he's probably watching so if I say too many nice things he's going to ask me for a raise or something but um absolutely love the contributions that, that Gary makes to our department and he and Karen are in so many ways the heart and soul of Bulldog Athletics and, and love working with them every day. It's uh, it's really good stuff. Uh, I'll wrap up with the last question. I think that, that the men's basketball alumni, and, and I think this is a theme through our programs, but they're really well connected. They're passionate. They're proud. You know, I'd love to hear a little bit from you, and, and I'm sure the group would, about what it means to be part of a program that means so much to you and the relationships and you stay connected. And I've, I've been around a lot of programs that have that, but I've been around some that, that frankly don't have that kind of connectivity and, and, and that bond. So Bulldog men's basketball certainly does. Uh, I, I was on one of the, the alumni Zooms and, and the chirping was impressive. Um, talk a little bit about being part of that group and, and being somebody that, that in a lot of ways is the glue of that group. Yeah, I'll tell you, it uh, what we have is so special. I talked with Gary Hoquist about this a few months ago. Um, you can't you can't uh, manufacture that what what we have there in terms of the connection, the relationships, uh, the, that camaraderie. Uh, does winning a lot of basketball games help? That it certainly does, because as you know, Josh, so many programs across the country. Um, at all levels that don't experience winning and that success that we did in that time, certainly that helps. But even when we, you know, there, there are times where we lost games, you know, and it wasn't like it was all um, uh, great all the time, but we always stuck together, you know, and then, and then you couple it with what we were able to do in the community and the way the community supported us. It's so nice to see, you know, what Justin's doing with his team when he takes them out to do things in the community to kind of give back. Uh, the kids might look at it as, oh, we got to go out and maybe do this. You know, let's go get it done. They won't, they'll realize in, in several years how meaningful that was to themselves, not only to the people that they, they, they went out and helped, but what it meant for helping shape their thought process and how they manage things moving forward. And, you know, it's a culture. It's a culture that just permeates throughout the, the whole campus, you know, starts in administration and it works its way down at every level. And certainly in, in the athletic administration, you've brought that to the table. Um, it's a culture that we want to live by. Um, we make a, we're intentional about how we want to get things done. Uh, and we're not, 
We're not tearing people down, but the mission is to build them up. And sometimes you got to strip some layers off and that's not tearing anyone down, but that's how we build you up. It's how we help you realize your potential. And your potential may not be necessarily realized in the four years at UMD, but it will be there. That's the groundwork. It's the foundation. And the relationships then are something you can rely on. I mean, alumni network and connections, when you're down, you need a job change, you need just a pick me up. It's great that we can pick up the phone and we have these networks. And you can sense that in the, the coaching staffs that you have, that these coaches have these players' backs. They're, in, they're invested in that long-term success of living a productive life and being happy and be able to come back and share memories. It's not just the wins or the losses. Those are a great byproduct of doing things the right way and wanting things to work out the right way and putting in the hard work and time to do it and rewarding that, celebrating those victories along the way. So that's, that's what it's really all about. And uh, I think that's what holds us all together. That's why we're, we're so vested in what Justin's doing with the program now. We're excited about the, the direction it's on. We know the kids. I mean, what kid doesn't want to win, right? But it's, it's having that mentorship that I think Justin's brought now to the program, showing them this is – he's leading. He's showing them how to be successful. And, and success that, that win is a byproduct of doing all those right things. So hats off to where you guys are at. And obviously it's across the board, the women's program, you know, your hockey programs, volleyball, softball, baseball, it's across the board. It's a culture. And, uh, and if we could bottle up and keep it for ourselves, we would, but we know a lot of programs out there, they understand the same things. That's why it's so fun to watch how competitive it truly is because uh, um, it's just, it's just a great time in their lives. And these kids are just experiencing so much sets them up for the rest of the, their life, quite honestly. Oh, I think you, know, you said it as, as well as it can be said, Jay, that was phenomenally um, eloquent and uh, certainly appreciate your perspective on it and your contributions to it um, in the past and in the present and staying connected and, 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 and being a part of, of that legacy. I, I couldn't agree more. The, um, the broad-based success academically through volunteerism, but then when you get to the competitive piece, seeing so many programs having national level, conference level competitive success is really unique. And it makes it a lot of fun to be a part of. Um, it makes it really hard sometimes to figure out where to be because you've got so many teams that are on the cusp of big games and NCAA tournaments, and we get pulled in a lot of directions. The, the staff and the coaches find a way to keep it all rolling. And, and as we come out of this COVID stuff, we look forward to getting back at it. That second week of March when everything stopped, we had a track athlete who was ready to compete at the D2 Indoor Nationals. Our women's basketball team was the night before their, uh, their second straight NCAA tournament, really, in my opinion, poised to go on a deep run. Um, our men's hockey team was ready to roll. Our softball team and baseball team had gotten back from successful spring break. So it was, it was tough and, and we'll get right back at it. Uh, hopefully this fall, I, we think it's going to be this fall. It's probably going to look a little different, but we think it's going to be this fall and, and, uh, excited to get back to competition and sports being a bright spot in society, uh, like we're, we've traditionally been. So I, I just want to thank you so much for being generous with your time and, and your, your business and family demands that you've got going on to give back to the Bulldogs. It's been great to hear your stories. Uh, I, I had been aware of some of them, but to hear them firsthand, and I'm sure the group enjoyed them. I could, the chat was pretty active, so I think everybody uh, truly enjoyed the, the questions today and, and your, your stories, and that means a lot. And, and I would just want to wish all of our guests today uh, that, that joined us uh, happy, healthy, and, and all the success. Jay, thanks so much again. It's really been a pleasure to be with you. You're welcome. I enjoyed it very much. Hello to everyone. And I echo your thoughts. Uh, stay safe. I uh, look forward to this fall. We're excited to get back and uh, safely and can't wait to see more Bulldog action. All right, Jay. Well, thanks to you again and everyone else. Be well. Go Bulldogs. Take care now. Goodbye, guys.